All right, well, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ian Davids, and I'm part of uh, the Xbox One team here at Unity. Uh, I have the privilege of working with some pretty smart guys, Alex being one of them. Um, uh, the, it's been great to be part of the console team and to, uh, to grow as, as Unity's console presence has grown. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is our platform plugins. There's been a lot of hype about these lately, um, simply because uh, we've been recognizing that uh, the platform, the native plugins, are a way of us uh, exposing our source code to you guys and also getting out of your way in a lot of ways. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the challenges that we've had, uh, but also about the history on Xbox specifically, um, of how we've gotten to where we're at today. Um, but before I do that, uh, I need to talk about the fact that this is a closed platform. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna, we're not going to talk about Xbox today. We're going to talk about Windows and AOT platforms specifically. Um, let me just see a show of hands. How many of you are on uh, the ID program at this point? So we got, we got a few of you. How many people are thinking of joining the ID program? Got a few? All right. Um, I've included the URL in case you haven't uh, seen it of where to go to, uh, to get on the program. So in the past, uh, consoles on Unity have just embedded all platform-specific functionality into the engine. Um, this is, this is a, has been a blessing and a curse for us. It's tightly integrated, um, which means that everything works together. But it's also, it also means that um, features are not visible to you guys necessarily. Um, and also, the core of Unity gets a lot more eyes because it's view, visible by all of the platforms. Whereas platform-specific code tends to get a subset of Unity looking at it, the Unity community looking at it. So uh, this approach has been, uh, been a challenge in some ways because sometimes there's bugs in Unity that uh, and the platform teams are smaller, so sometimes there's bugs in these platform-specific features that have hindered you guys from shipping. Um, and in addition, uh, this is inflexible because it doesn't allow you to extend the engine. So if we've implemented a particular feature, say our Connect support or whatnot, and we're not supporting it in just the right way you need for your game, um, you don't have the ability to extend that without writing your own complete plugin from scratch. Uh, and also, this is an all-or-nothing approach which means that um, the engine's growing as we add all these features. And you're also on notice to all the XRs for all the features we've added. So uh, just like on Sony platforms where you have TRCs, you have XRs on Xbox One. Um, and so it actually increases your testing burden. So what we've been looking to do today is move as much as possible of the platform-specific functionality out of Unity and to ship these with source to you guys. Um, and this gives us quite a bit of advantage. It gives us flexibility. You can take and gut them, use them as a starting place for your own projects. It gives you transparency. You can see how we've implemented them. If you're seeing some performance problems, you can take a look at perhaps why that's happening. And the last thing is their opt-in, which we talked about, but I'll talk about a little more later. So this doesn't come free. Um, we have to pay the piper. Um, there's some additional costs here. So one of the things is because the platform plugins can be revved at a different rate than the engine, we need to work hard to keep the platform plugins independent of a given version of Unity, which means that the platform plugins try very, very hard, at least for Xbox One, um, and I know that you guys are probably doing the same. Um, they're trying very, very hard to not depend on Unity Engine.dll or anything else inside Unity. Um, and that, that increases our burden. It also means that there's hookups that we're providing to you guys that you actually have to hook up with Unity. So that your setup costs are a little bit higher. Um, and it also means that a lot of engine features that are really flexible and really powerful aren't available, available to us when we're writing these plugins. Um, one of those in particular is accessing some of the mono functionality. Um, I'll talk about this a bit in a bit when we talk about callbacks back into managed land from a native plugin. Um, but that actually causes us a little bit of difficulty. Um, in addition, there's been uh, some talk because I, I'm using the term platform plugin here um, because 
the, at least for Xbox One, and I know for, for PS4, these things are very targeted. They're very specific to, to the consoles that they're written for. Um, and Unity, of course, has this philosophy of write once, run everywhere. Um, and uh, this is actually really important to us. We value that concept here at Unity. Um, but at the moment, these things are very, very platform specific. So our goal is right now to build a foundation. The Xbox One project is, is uh, it's growing. It's, it's kind of still in beta, so we're still figuring out some of these things. Um, but what, right now what we're focusing on is building a, a foundation, a very strong foundation that exposes the platform API to you guys um, and kind of gets out of your way. Our hope is to eventually build on top of that and build some cross-platform constructs that you guys can use and leverage. But we're not there yet. This is the future. That doesn't exist. And well, we're still implementing this stuff. So before I go on, I have to, I have to of course, show the, comp the, uh, the Unity stand-in for everything. Excuse me here. I should have had it queued up. Let's see if it will show. Oh, I should have embedded it and tested it beforehand. All right, so we're loading here. Skip ahead. So we've just entered an engagement screen, and it pops your engagement. Who are you? So you've logged in. We're now in Angry Bots. The Xbox One recognizes us. We're going ahead, and we're, we're fighting some bots. You can see at the top there, oh, well, can't see anymore. I brought up my statistics window on the side. I've got some leaderboard data, my achievements for this game. And up in the top right-hand corner here, you can see my gamer tag and my, my uh, uh, gamer pick, as well as my achievements. Now, one of my achievements is to open a door. It's my basic training achievement. And that was achieved, and you can see I got a toast about it. So now the guy's running around, and he's going to take on a mech. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a badass, so I'm gonna run up straight to the mech, and of course I can't aim at worth beans. So I take on the mech, I managed to kill him eventually, and that was awesome. So uh, I'm gonna go record a game DVR clip. And that's pretty much it. That's the platform plugins for Xbox One operating in a game. As pretty much as they currently stand, there's a lot more to it. And apparently, let's see if I can get this back up. Sorry, I apologize. All right. So uh, as we started approaching writing our own internal plugins, we looked at what was available to us. The first thing, of course, Mono has this thing called iCall. That's not available. The next thing is the natural thing to gravitate to is a managed wrapper. Uh, and on Windows, um, Windows platforms, um, they're WinRT platforms, and so that's not available to us. Because man managed code and WinRT can't coexist. WinRT, of course, would be nice, but we're a mono platform, so that's not available to us. And I'll talk a bit about what WinRT is in the future. So finally, we're stuck with pinvoke. This is the only, thing, the only .NET tool we have to expose this stuff. Um, and for those of you that don't know, pinvoke is a C-style solution to expose static functions up to C-sharp. Um, so um, what we ended up with was, as we started writing these things, was a native library. And because we're using pinvoke, there's an export, export piece. So all of our native plugins will have a set of export files that has our pinvoke interface, um, or at least on Xbox One. And uh, these guys are extern C functions to avoid name mangling so we can pull them in with pinvoke. And then of course, it wouldn't be complete if we didn't give you the C sharp side of that equation. So there's an import set of stuff. And these, these are named plugin.cs. So if we have a, a friends plugin, it'll be friends, pl uh, friends plugin.cs. So that pulls in the various functions with a DLL import statement from that particular plugin. And then we found that this was actually fairly cumbersome to use. Um, unfortunately, uh, at least in Windows, it's a highly asynchronous platform. And uh, 
using a PNFOC interface to deal with this highly asynchronous platform is actually kind of ugly because you're dealing with callbacks, you're dealing with all sorts of um, data that you want to marshal back and forth, and usually you're dealing with objects in native land, and you really want those objects to live in C Sharp as well, so that you have, kind of have a correspondence between what you're dealing with in native land and what you're dealing with in C Sharp. And so what we ended up doing was actually writing wrappers that look a lot like the low-level native pieces in this import library. So we have library pairs. There's an import library and a native library. And so I'm going to jump back to this concept of, of opt-in. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with this pair concept. We could have just chosen to bundle everything into one big library. It would have been pretty simple. You could have just dropped it in and away you go. But uh, we felt that this was actually a really important concept to preserve. So there's a lot of, a lot of cases where you really don't care about having all the functionality of the platform. So ga some games won't necessarily want to ship DLC. Some games, they're not going to want to be Kinect games. Other games, they're going to want to be single player games. Other games, they don't care about some of the cool streaming features for installing your, your game on a particular platform. So what we ended up doing was siloing our DLLs um, based on sort of discipline within the, within the platform. And that actually created a problem for us because some of the functionality wants to be reused between the DLLs. So if we built a user's plugin, well, friends naturally wants to be able to consume some of that functionality. So do we duplicate it or what do we do? We ended up building a, the ability for these guys to intercommunicate at the native level. Um, and there's a new thing called the event queue on Xbox One, which uh, I'll talk about in a bit. But these plugins can find each other if you initialize them and they'll consume each other. But that's all done at the native level. So from C Sharp, all you have to know is you have to initialize them one frame ahead of when you actually need them. <clears throat> so what are our focuses currently? Well, we've got quite a bit of functionality. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But um, what we're focusing on right now, we've kind of asked you guys what, um, what you thought of it. And there was quite a bit of feedback. One of the things that came in was the fact that these um, plugins have a, quite a bit of setup overhead. And so we've been focusing on trying to reduce that a bit. Um, so we're working on giving you guys a binary distribution of the plugins, because at the moment they're source only. There's a, a particular library for us that is called Data Platform that uh, uh, has some code gen requirements. And we've actually created a, a new system in there called Dynamic Events that gets rid of the need for that. Um, it, there's code gen still, but it's in your project now. It's no longer in the platform plugins. Um, in addition, we're giving you hardware video playback because some of, some of the people who are working on Xbox Ones are getting to the point where they're ready to start looking at submitting and uh, they're dealing with load times issues. So um, this is what we have today. We have some console utils, data platform, friends, game DVR, gamepad, marketplace, streaming install, storage, text systems, users, connect, and this funny thing called the log plugin. And I'll talk a bit about that in a second. That ties into the fact that um, we don't want to have a dependency on the engine itself, and we want to try and facilitate a better debugging experience with these. Um, anyways, moving on from that. The future, it's a dialogue with you guys. Um, there's lots that we could do. It's kind of all scattered around. Tons and tons of stuff we could, we could be working on. Um, but our focus is on what you guys need. Um, we've been prioritizing uh, where we go next based on who's asking for what. Um, and we've been trying to meet your needs as quickly as possible. Of course, that's difficult to do when there's a lot of you, and some of you guys have needs for different pieces, very separate pieces. So I'm now gonna start diving into some of the mechanics of this stuff. And way back in the day of Windows 8's inception, uh, Microsoft released, I think it was Windows 8 when it came out, a concurrency library that had this thing called an asynchronous oper uh, operation in it. Um, and we've actually chosen to model a lot of our API after that because um, our platform is highly concurrent. So uh, you, if, you, if you're familiar with Windows, you're familiar with the way that the stuff works, it kind of feels the same. It's different, but it feels the same. In addition, the async op also gives us the chance to hang our hat somewhere. And we're gonna be talking about AOT in a second. And AOT actually is uh, a fairly big restriction for us because of the, the asynchronous nature of the platform. And uh, the asynchronous actually gives us a place to uh, deal with the garbage collector 
uh, at a very intimate level um, and be able to deal with the fact that we only have static functions in AOT land. Um, so these async ops, I'm gonna talk a bit about them because they've been confusing. Some of our, our users have talked about them in the past. Um, they behave kind of like an asynchronous operation. There's sort of two patterns that you have to deal with. One of them is you provide a callback. So you're doing something async and you provide a callback. And what you get back, usually you're asking for a snapshot. So you're going off across the wire or you're, who knows what you're doing there. Um, it's gonna take some time. So you're asking for an object back that's a snapshot that represents some state. And uh, you're gonna get back an object and you're also gonna get back the original, the, an async op. And that thing has some state, lets you check whether or not the thing that you were doing was successful or not. But there's a secondary pattern to using these things. And that's a polling pattern. In a lot of cases, we've seen a need for this kind of uh, code. Um, because our games are, because we're building games and they have an update loop, they're iterative. Uh, often what you'll do in the callback is you'll set some flag and then in the update, you'll move to the next phase or you'll do whatever's appropriate there. Um, so async ops try to help you with that a bit. They have several different data members. The interesting one is it is complete. So you don't need to, you don't actually need to implement the callback. And they also have a result value, which is an error code that's associated. If something did go wrong, at least you can get access to that. So uh, you can use them in this fashion. This is what we call the polling style. Um, so you can ignore the callback in this case. You get the async call from whatever the operation is you're doing and now you can check whether or not the operation is complete in your update loop. So uh, this is a good little chance for an aside, kind of a break between technical details and other stuff. Um, what these import plugins that we've been building have been causing people, people a little bit of grief, and uh, it's a good chance to kind of dive into AOT a little bit because we're gonna talk about it in a minute. Um, what happens when you take an assembly that you've built with Microsoft Visual Studio and you dump it into Unity. Well, on a standard, normal uh, platform, that, that assembly could be consumed. But on an AOT platform, things are a little bit different. Um, we generate a native and a metadata pair. This happens at export time when you're building the application. And that thing, that's a standard native DLL. It's pre-jitted, so to speak. But this thing down here, that thing still looks like an assembly. And on platforms like iOS, um, that's fine. On some other platforms, that's not fine because you can't have the assemblies on the platform. So there's some additional post-processing processing that goes on. And we kind of munge it. Now why do we need metadata? We need it because of reflection. So assemblies are, are kind of two pieces. If you know anything about WinRT, you know that WinRT is really a DLL and a metadata pair combined together inside a DLL, the WinMD files that they create. Um, but AOT has the same problem, and so we actually generate two files, the native DLL and the metadata or reflection data. And it's, it's worth noting that if you missed Jonathan Chambers' excellent talk on IELTS CPP, IELTS CPP is gonna take a different approach with this. It's actually gonna embed the metadata into your native DLL, which will be pretty cool. Um, it will reduce the memory requirements, it will reduce some of your load times challenges because uh, you don't have two pieces to load, uh, which will be great. So why is this an issue? It's because of this plugins folder. A lot of people tend to drop plugins in that plugin folder, all your plugins, because it makes a lot of sense, right? It's a plugins folder. Should be a place where you can drop plugins. Uh, unfortunately, with import libraries on an AOT platform or assemblies on an AOT platform, this folder behaves a lot like your streaming assets folder. It's kind of a contract that Unity will take those things and copy them into your final executable. It doesn't do any post-processing on that stuff, which means that AOT and any post-processing that's required is not necessarily gonna happen. So on platforms that require AOT, you need to be cognizant of this. So this is at least a 4.3 restriction right now. 5.0, we may be able to do some smart things to get rid of this, but right now, it's, it's something that you need to be cognizant of if you're working with our platform plugins. Alrighty, so let's dive into debugging platform plugins. The first thing is that because we're giving you source, the opportunities for debugging are expanded. You have source code, you can actually debug these things, but you don't necessarily have source code to the player. 
So to help you with that, we've given you this funky little command line switch in the player called wait for debugger. It works in debug and development builds. And if you set it, this at least works on Xbox One. I'm not sure about PS4, whether or not that was taken. Um, but if you set it, then the, game, the player will stall until you attach your debugger, and away you go. So you can set some breakpoints, attach to the player, and away you go, you can be debugging your platform plugins in native land. Now this isn't for everybody. Um, so there's some other tools that we've provided. Uh, one of them is this, this log plugin. Now I talked before about the log plugin and, and why it's a little bit weird and why it exists. Um, we built the log plugin because we don't want to necessarily want to tie into the debug.log functionality in the engine, specifically because we don't want to have to link against Unity engine.dll. Because the instant we start doing that, we create a coupling between the version of the engine and the version of the platform plugins. And part of the, the advantage of the platform plugins is their flexibility. We can rev the platform plugins at a different rate as the engine. And also, the platform plugins will be compatible with 5 or 4.3. So you can take the same version of the platform plugins and use it with either version of the player. Um, and we think that's a huge advantage and it's worth preserving. So one of the things we've done is created this log plugin. And the log plugin, all you need to do to use it is turn it on. So you need to create it. That pretty much reaches out, loads the PM, through pinvoke, loads the log plugin, activates it. And now, through the magic of the event queue that I talked about, the, uh, when any plugin needs to send an exception information or errors or log or any trace information, it just reaches out, grabs the log plugin, sends it across, and then the log plugin has the concept of, of targets. So it can log to a file, it can do, call output debug string, and log to Visual Studio, or it can hit manage land, and we'll, we'll cover that next. These channels can be filtered, so you can say, I want exceptions and errors to hit manage land, but everything else go to the, plug, the, the plugin log. Um, so it's pretty flexible. And of course, because it's, just an inter because it's an interface that we expose to the other plugins, you can take and gut it and write your own version of this. If what we're doing is not what you need, you can of course improve it. You can write across the wire to some cool debugging service that you have. You can make it do screenshots, whatever you feel like. Um, so uh, the, the plugin log manager has a callback or an event that you can register for, and you get the channel information, so was this an exception or an error, and the debug string. In addition, you can set the log path, um, which allows you to hit the various devices that the console support. And I'm just gonna go over this really quickly. Um, the exception information or error information that it's generating is actually pretty verbose. It gives you information about which plugin generated it, the file name and line number, a message, and an error code. And the reason why I actually bring this up is because in Windows, if you guys remember Windows 8, um, when, you gen when you throw an exception, the string that's associated with that, uh, that exception um, is not visible unless you have a debugger attached. Uh, this is a Windows 8 restriction, not 8.1. Microsoft relaxed it in 8.1. And so what we do, and on Windows platforms um, is we actually backfill that for you. If there's no debugger attached and we can't get the exception string, we actually look up the code and we have a massive table in the log plugin. And we've tried to augment that to help you with your, debu your debugging experience. If there's certain things that people commonly run into and there's some common solutions for it, we've tried to include that in the message to make your life a little easier. In addition, I talked a bit about callbacks. Now, um, in AOT land, we'll get into it a bit, but in AOT land, um, you were restricted in the kind of callback that we have. But in addition, because we're, in, we're running in a plugin, we don't have access to mono. So if you let an exception just go, just free, and it propagates up the callbacks, that, that callback stack in mono, and it reaches the top, well, mono is gonna wanna shut down the thread that that thing's running on. So we don't, because we don't have access to mono, we can't do smart things with that exception. We can't just log it somewhere for you or whatever. So what we've done in our platform plugins is we've caught it globally at the top of every callback and we run it through the, the log plugin for you. And we give you a lot of information. We tell you that in a callback from the plugin, so it could be the user's plugin, friend's plugin, whatever, there was a manage exception that was thrown and we give you the full call stack. So again, we're trying to make your life easier there. So now, um, I'm gonna dive a little bit into some of the challenges we've had writing these things. You're gonna face the same things when you write plugins for these platforms. Um, 
Specifically, I'm going to be looking at challenges that we have on AOT platforms. Um, unfortunately, just like any technical dive, it's going to be way too technical for some people, and other people are going to think I'm not going deep enough. So bear with me. Hopefully, I don't put you to sleep. <clears throat> so these are the, the specific kind of the challenges I'm going to be looking at. Um, I'm going to be looking at AOT and pinvoke. The fact that modern machines, like a Windows machine, um, deals with a highly asynchronous API. And the fact that we're dealing with some new technologies like WinRT. So the first thing to deal with is pinvoke. So uh, I talked about, I alluded to this before. Um, in an AOT environment, and specifically uh, when dealing with pinvoke, um, you have only have the ability to call back to a static function. And it's worse because you can only call back to a static function that's been marked up with a special attribute. I've got it up there, it's a little bit hard to read, but it's called mono p invoke callback attribute. You have to give the type of the delegate. Um, and this tells mono that it should fix that address and that it's safe to call. Because an AOT compiler, it's an ahead of time compiler. And in a JIT world, the, the JIT compiler would emit a little piece of bootstrap code that would allow you to call back into any delegate. But we can't do that in AOT land, so you have to play by the rules. Um, so we've lost the calling object instance. And unfortunately, that's a serious issue with C-sharp. So for us, since we're forced to use a C-style export mechanism, a C-style solution is in order. And for those of you that have been around for a bit, you had to write a game in C, you remember that way back in the day, the way to handle this was to pass a void star around to a structure, and your callback knew what that void star was, and it would cast it back to the structure, and it would deal with the object data. We're gonna pretty much do the same sort of thing, but with an object called a GC handle. And it, this, is, it, this is actually important. The, the type of object we've chosen is important. A lot of people would naturally gravitate to uh, a pinning solution where they'd fix the object in memory, but um, that's not gonna be that, that's, kind of, that's not gonna be a very good general solution because it's actually gonna defeat Mono's ability to, to garbage collect effectively. You're gonna get a lot of fragmentation. So what is this GC handle thing? Well, when you allocate, what do people normally think of? Well, you allocate, you get a pointer to some location in memory. In modern garbage collection environments, that's not actually what's usually happening. There's usually some data structure in between the actual pointer and the memory. And this facilitates the mark and sweep process in the garbage collector because the garbage collector is gonna wanna crunch that memory to avoid fragmentation. Um, and that's where GC handles come in. So you have the ability to tell Mono to basically fix that thing, that thing in the handle table, whatever it is. I'm not gonna to talk too much about the detail. This is an oversimplification of the problem, but um, it, it's good enough for our purposes. And what you get back is basically an integer value that, um, that also is a self-reference as well. It's gonna ensure the object doesn't die, and it's a nice plain old data type that we can pass around and get back to the original object with. And this is really important because A, we didn't have to pin anything, so the garbage collector's free to move around stuff in memory again, and B, is a nice little plain old data type that we can pass down to native land, and it's gonna avoid marshalling, it's gonna be quite useful for us. So, our solution to this particular AOT callback problem, it, we call it user data, so what we pass down is a static function, your callback, and some user data, which is this GC handle. And so you can see here, we've got some object. We uh, reached out and we asked the garbage collector for the GC handle, which ensured that object's never gonna get deleted even if we lose all references to it. We passed our callback down, which is this marked up, ugly looking callback. We tend to call that a thunk uh, because it's kind of an in-between intermediate, but it's kind of an odd name for it. And uh, we passed that down to native land. At some future point, native land's gonna call us back and it's gonna pass the GC handle back to us on that static callback. The static callback is then gonna recreate my object or recreate a reference to my object and it's gonna call back into it. So this solves our problem that we were having before where we don't have um, our object instance anymore. Unfortunately, it's pretty ugly. But we have a saving grace, which is that a lot of our API follows a fairly st standard pattern, and we can use this object called an async op that I was talking about before, 
um, as a place to hang our hat. That my object is the async op, and we can attach, on, attach onto it any delegate or other object that we need to be able to uh, keep track of. So if you have a general purpose C-sharp event, we attach that onto it, pass us through the, through the entire process, and then we call you back from the async op once we're done. The second thing, I kind of have that little diagram that we were just talking about up there in the right-hand corner. The second thing we kind of ignored here is the fact that this is often done because we're dealing with a callback, which is usually done on a secondary thread. So what happens is we've got some, some place where we're calling out. It's going to call out. It's going to do its work on the secondary thread. And what we like to happen is for the update to happen on the main thread. But unfortunately, all we have is this static callback. What's really going to happen is this. And those of you know, this is a bad thing to do in a general way in Unity because there's portions of Unity that aren't that thread safe. And so because we're building a general purpose library, we can't guarantee what you're going to touch inside Unity and uh, in your callback. And so we needed a way to solve this in a general way. So enter the event queue. We fire an event at this point. Because these are asynchronous functions that we're calling, a little bit of delay is not a big deal. So this event at some future point could be across a frame. It could be immediately. It gets serviced, and the update happens on the main thread. So this has been our, our approach to solving this in a very general way across uh, the entire API that we needed to wrap. Now, we had a choice of where we did it. Uh, we could have chosen to do it here. Um, which has some advantages. Um, everything's encapsulated. Those people looking at just the C-sharp side of things don't have to worry about the event queue at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, or we could have choos chosen to do it here, which has some other advantages in that it's easier for other people to latch on and use. Um, and actually, we'd like to provide both. At the moment, what we have is just the native level. Um, but in the future, we're looking to potentially provide a C-sharp version of the same thing. So uh, it's worth for some people in the room to talk about the event queue and the, the technology that we're providing on this particular platform. Um, so what is an event queue? Well, events come in on a bunch of different threads. They get queued up. And then at some future point, they get handled by a listener, uh, potentially multiple listeners. So that's what our event queue does. It's a zero allocation atomic event queue that's exposed to your plugin at startup. So when your plugin starts up, you get access to this thing. Um, it's all done in native land, so C Sharp doesn't have to see it. You don't have to pass it around. Um, your payload's a structure. That thing shouldn't allocate. It needs to only deal, be dealing with plain old data types. It uses GUIDs to allow you to add events if you feel like it, if you want to extend this stuff, so that way you guys aren't colliding with events from our libraries or from other people's libraries that you pull down from the asset store. And it works intra-plugin, so you can send an event and another plugin can see it. Also, it works between the engine and your plugins. And we actually use that for some features. And it's how we handle the intra-plugin discovery. We pass interfaces back and forth. So the next issue. Um, sometime around Windows 8 again, Microsoft introduced this new technology called WinRT. Um, WinRT is a bit of a confusing name because some people have associated it with Metro, or the, at least the technology formerly known as Metro. Um, uh, WinRT is not that. The other thing that's a bit confusing because WinRT uses the little hat symbol that most of us associate with XOR um, is we associate it with managed C++ because that's, of course, another place where this is used. It's not that either. What it is is syntactic sugar for COM or DCOM. Um, and so when you see one of these things, think COM pointer. Think a smart pointer to a COM object. So when you assign one of these things, you're doing add refs. When you cast one of these things, you're dealing with uh, an I unknown with a query interface. So you need to think about that. And for those of you that are working on Windows platforms, uh, a really interesting object that you should dig deep into is an I vector view. Um, it actually has some deep implications. And again, think DCOM. All right. So the Windows concurrency uh, framework. Um, 
this, this is where we, we got, this, this technology exists on Windows, it exists on all modern Windows platforms. Um, you need to think about this stuff, you need to understand it. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say about it, because it's, it's important. Um, actually, I'll, I'll dig a little bit into it. Um, so this is, this is some Windows code. It's using CX11, and this is stuff that confused us the first time we saw it. Um, what you're seeing here is, of course, the new auto keyword. You're seeing the fact that you're doing something async. You see that we're returning a, a handler. So this is stuff that you see anywhere if you Google on the, online. And you see the fact that we're using a closure um, with, again, WinRT mixed in. Um, so what happens if we throw an exception in this asynchronous piece up here? This is what's called a value type return in WinRT land or in, um, in modern Windows programming. And so this value type, this exception is thrown on this background thread here. You can't put a try catch block around it. So the issue is this guy right here, you're returning some result and you've got You've got your result value right here. There's a way to deal with that, and that's to use create task. Um, create task queues up the exception, and it will rethrow it when you try and access the result. And this is this is a standard Windows thing. You can Google it. You'll find all sorts of good stuff online about this. It'd be good for you guys to to understand this stuff if you're going to dig into platform plugins. I'm going to skip over this. So in summary, plugins are modular opt-in libraries with source. They're a dialogue between us and you. This is really important. They're a dialogue between us and you. We want to know the problems you're having. We want to be able to grow these. We want to walk in the directions that you guys need. Um, and uh, we also want to be able to share with you guys where we're going. Um, they're, they're, at least for, for the platforms that I work on, they deal with async, a, asynchronous calls, which is something you need to be aware of. They're, they're sitting on top of pinvoke, and they work on AOT platforms. And they deal with a lot of platform-specific issues. And in addition, there's some challenges that we face specific to WinRT and CX11 that you guys should be familiar with when you're digging into our source code. So I know it's early really early. I ran through that a little bit quicker than I thought I would. But um, it's a good time for questions. So are there any questions? In the back there? <clears throat> the platform specific issues? Um, I can't talk about them. I can talk about Windows specific stuff that's a little bit challenging, but if I dig into that stuff, I'd be really happy to go over that stuff with you. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, I'll definitely be at the hands-on section and uh, we can chat tonight or we can go chat tomorrow uh, if you're on the ID program um, because digging into the actual platform details um, are, is probably a little bit too much and it's gonna violate NDAs, so cool. Any more? Oh, perfect. Uh, I just want to clarify, uh, so this talk was about creating your own native, native plugins, but the ones that you guys have created, um, they're intended to be handled at the C-sharp layer? There, there are two pieces. There's a native piece and there's a C-sharp piece. Um, and the C-sharp piece is to make your life easier. Mm -hmm. uh, you can dump that in any folder as long as it's not a plugins folder in your game. And the native piece needs to go in the plugins folder like you would do with any native plugin. Um, you're free to just consume our C-sharp interface if you feel like it, or you can rip them apart and use them as a starting place for your own. Um, we, we're hoping you will, and we're hoping that you'll send back some of the stuff that you've done. Um, obviously, we realize that sometimes that's a competitive, competitive advantage, mm -hmm. and we don't want to take that away from you. But uh, if you're having problems writing platform plugins, there's an internal user group which is looking at how to improve write, the process of writing platform plugins for Unity, um, or writing native plugins for Unity. And I know that I've had some discussions with some of you about uh, areas that you've had challenges, 
uh, with writing plugins, and we'd love to hear it. Um, we'd love to look at ways of making this process easier for you. Okay. Does that uh, answer? Yeah, and could you also clarify, uh, you had some good details on uh, how events work at the native level, but mm -hmm. uh, what, what do we need to think about um, for those platform level events when they come into Unity, or into, into the C-sharp layer? Um, we've, we've actually handled all the, the threading specific details because it ha happens on the main thread. Mm -hmm. And that's actually why we're doing that, so that it's completely thread safe. You don't have to worry about anything thread related once it comes back because you're operating on the main thread and you're operating in a synchronous fashion at that point. Okay. Um, and that's all handled at the native layer. Okay, uh, one last thing that is more specific and I'm actually not sure if I can ask this question. Um, mm -hmm. Suspend on Xbox One uh, has a timer associated with when you need to respond to it? Are there issues around the, the latency of, of the events and handling <laughs> them and how you deal with that? Yeah, that's probably going too deep. Okay, um, I'm, I'm <laughs> I'll happy find you later. <laughs> I'm happy to chat with you about that further. Any other questions? In the back. It's a very good question. So the question was, for those that didn't hear it, is whether or not on uh, Android and iOS there's a move to, to take the same route. Um, it's certainly something that we, on the consoles team, feels very valuable. Um, but this is something that's gonna kind of been spearheaded by us. Um, consoles within Unity tend to be um, uh, smaller little groups working on these platforms. And so we've been looking for ways to make your life easier. Um, and so it's definitely started grassroots within our, uh, within our group. Um, but we believe this is something that's, that's more valuable to do on a larger scale. Um, and, of course, we'll be looking at that in the future, but I, I can't promise anything. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, just out of curiosity, um, what, what was it that meant you couldn't use iCall? Uh, the fact that um, we don't have access to any of the headers of Unity just like you guys don't. Um, we don't have access to any of the guts of Unity, just like you guys don't. Uh, these things are real plugins. They're not playing anything, they're not doing anything fast and loose to access stuff that you guys don't have access to. Um, and so because of that, we don't have access to iCall. And you couldn't have had Unity ask the plugin to provide a list of iCall that wants to register at startup or something? <coughs> uh, we could have, um, but uh, we were looking for minimal overhead there, minimal, minimal glue code to write at the C-sharp level. Um, and this is the simplest way to do it. Uh, it's, it's worked out quite well. Um, P invoke is a little ugly, but it's, it's worked out quite well for us. Um, yeah. So, yes. Um, I've looked through your, um, through your Xbox One samples, and um, obviously you've done a lot of stuff to abstract yourself, to generalize, to make yourself independent from the engine. Um, it does make it complex. Um, mm -hmm. Is that the recommendation for all of us to just follow the exact same patterns? So, like in my case, I don't care if I'm a little bit tied to the engine, to be honest. It's, it's not a recommendation for you guys. Um, the question was, uh, I should definitely repeat that, that was a good question. Um, the, the, we, are, we are taking steps to try and make ourselves independent from the engine uh, so that we can rev these things at a different rate. Um, and that's made the plugins a little more complex in some places. Uh, and whether or not our recommendation is that you guys follow the same pattern. Um, uh, that's definitely not the case. You are free to link directly to Unity Engine yourself and, uh, and go to town. Um, it, it's, it, it's something that we've done simply to make your life easier because we don't want you to take a new, new drop of the platform plugins and have to upgrade versions of the engine to work with it or to have to hack the pla platform plugins to make that work. Um, as best as possible, we're making our platform plugins only depend on the console specific libraries, and that's it. So, make sense? Anyone else? I think we're good. So we're, uh, we're gonna end a little early, um, about 20 minutes early, um, but you guys probably wanna get to the party tonight anyways, so have fun. Thanks.